Hey, everybody. Good to see you. Morning. Well, we're in this series called Build This House, so we're building a house. Hey, did you notice? Have you seen how it's been coming up here? It's pretty impressive. Um, it actually looks really tall on the stage, doesn't it? But that's because it's a small house. It's a tiny house, but it's actually to scale because most houses have eight-foot walls, and this is a, a standard door opening. And uh, some houses have 10-foot, 12-foot um, walls, but this is, this is standard right here. And so every house must have a good foundation, right? Every, if you don't have a good foundation, everything is going to be off, and eventually problems are going to surface. And when it comes to building this house, we're talking about the church, we want this, the, this, the foundation that should be the foundation of every healthy church. The Bible clearly declares that Jesus Christ is our foundation. One place it says he's the chief cornerstone. We're building on him. Jesus is the foundation of every healthy church, and that will always be true here. Jesus, just before he ascended to heaven, he gave some marching orders. He gave what we call the Great Gospel Commission. He said, go and make disciples who make disciples and, and go out in concentric circles and reach as many as possible. And every church has that same mission statement, but sometimes we find ways to refresh and, 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 and to uh, word it in different ways. And, and for the season we're in now, this is how we're wording our mission statement. Breaking barriers, building bridges, bringing hope. You know, the ultimate hope that can only be found in Jesus, right? But sometimes there's barriers that prevent people from finding that hope. And so we want to be about breaking barriers, building relational bridges so that hopefully people's hearts will be opened up to the hope that is found in Jesus. And we're talking about building this house, and we want to encourage everyone to be a part of this house and all in. And some of the ways we do that fundamentally is first with authentic community with groups. Pastor Hollis did the last two messages and did a great job raising these walls. The first wall we talked about is biblical community, authentic community, developing uh, close relationships with others. One of the best ways that happens is in groups. And then last week, Pastor Hollis talked about the importance of serving and how this opens up our heart in ways that, you know, gets rid of our selfishness. And, and we follow Jesus' example who said, the Son of Man did not come to, to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. When we join serving teams in and through the church, serving in the church, serving in the community, uh, this, this becomes a way for us to worship and to connect with others and to serve and to show people love as Jesus has asked us to do. So these are some, some basic walls to a, to a good house. Now today, we're putting on the roof. Anybody uh, here have a roof on their house? Yeah, most of you have a roof on your house. That's good. You know, they'll put roof all, all the time on stadiums. They're doing it more and more. They're putting domes in places where it gets cold. But boy, they didn't, I bet they wish they had one in Green Bay last night. Anybody watch that game? I still cannot believe that Green Bay lost at home in, you know, that vintage stadium. But, you know, here it is, like 12 degrees with a wind chill that makes it a zero, and they're out there, and then it starts snowing, kind of sleeting in the second half. That looked miserable. And I bet you they were wishing they had a dome. Because when it's hailing and, and raining and lightning, it's nice to be able to have a roof on your house so you can go in under the covering. And I want you to think of the roof on our house as the covering of God's uh, authority and God's blessing. When we're outside of that, we're not going to be the recipients the same way as we are when we're inside of that, right? And so we want to talk about what it means to be a recipient of God's blessings. What does it mean to be blessed by God? It simply means to be on the receiving end of His tangible and intangible favor. And what's better than being a recipient of God's favor? When you can see it intangibly and you can see it tangibly and you know that you are under his covering and under his authority. And one of the ways we do that is through giving. And so you'll notice the word on the top there is give as we're putting a roof on our structure this week. Somebody's saying right now, I know what you're saying. You're saying, oh no. The pastor's going to talk about money, and I've heard that's all churches are about, and I brought a friend, and this is going to be a disaster. Listen, I don't know if you know this. If you do, I'm going to remind you. If not, I'm going to inform you, okay? The Bible contains, watch this, 
some 500 verses on prayer. Prayer is important. Almost 500 verses on faith. Faith is important. But check this out. Over 2,000 verses on money and possessions. I'm a Bible teacher. I need to teach what the Bible teaches or I'm not being faithful. One out of every six verses in the New Testament is about money or possessions. 16 out of, I think it's 28 parables that Jesus taught is about money or, or possessions. Jesus talked more about money and possessions than he did about heaven or hell. And I would say those are important subjects, wouldn't you? So I am not going to apologize for teaching what the Bible says about money, okay? Because really, it's a, it's a question of our hearts. It's one of the ways we test our hearts is through money. Now, I don't know how many of you like leftovers. I, I love leftovers. You know, some people won't eat. They throw them all away, and they won't eat leftovers. It has to be fresh. But not me, because first of all, I'm not a good cook. And secondly, I'm married to an excellent cook. It's like I got gourmet chef all the time. And I have to spend more time exercising now that my wife is retired because she just goes, she cooks all the time and it's amazing. In fact, she's doing cooking classes and she just had one and, and it, was a, it, was, it was an amazing party and people were taking notes and I was thinking, I always know the food's good, but I don't know all this steps going into it. I, I better appreciate it all the more. But when there's leftovers, I want them because they're good heated up. I put them in the microwave. One thing we never do though, I've noticed over the years, is when we invite people over for dinner, we don't serve leftovers. It's always something fresh and the best, you know? And, and that's, you know, I, I could probably tell my wife, they wouldn't know, you know, just put it in another pet pan. And, but <laughs> never going to happen at our house. Now, I want you to think about this because this applies very much to our subject here. And the, one of the points I want you to get is that, that one of the ways I worship God is with my Money. This is worship we're going to talk about. I honor the Lord with my best, not with leftovers. Okay? Here's our key verse today. It's Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will, be, will brim over with new wine. Honor the Lord with your wealth. And, and what part? The first fruits, he says. You see, God blesses us to be a blessing. The first time God talks about being a blessing or about blessing somebody is in Genesis 12, where he's talking to Abraham and he says, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing. That's how it works with God. He blesses us so that we can be a blessing. If God raises your standard of living, then he is expecting you'll raise your standard of giving. Now, there are too many people who are living outside of God's will, thinking that this life is all about collecting. You know, you've seen that bumper sticker, the one with the most toys wins. There's nothing wrong with toys. But that's not what life is about, how many toys you have at the end. And so for us to change our hearts from what is natural and normal, but not aligned with God, we've got to be willing to come under his roof, come under him as our protector, as our authority, and realize that he really owns everything, which means we are managers, not owners when it comes to stuff, right? Now, money is a powerful thing. It is an extension of who we are. It, so much of our life is spent earning, allocating, spending, saving, investing, protecting money. And let's be clear on this. Money is not evil, okay? Don't misquote that verse like Pink Floyd did. Do you know that Pink Floyd song that starts with the cash register? <laughs> boom, 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 boom. You know that one? Money. Well, right in that song, it says, money, so they say, is the root of all evil. Well, that's how people love to misquote the Bible. The text actually says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The love. It's, it's, it's when we love the wrong thing. It's, it's, so money can be a very good thing, it can be a very positive thing, or it can be a negative thing, and it depends on where our heart is. Uh, money management is a spiritual issue. Now, here's something I want you to hear, okay? If you don't hear anything else, please hear this. I don't want something from you, I want something for you with this teaching. And I mean that. Just like when we talked about serving here, Pastor Al said, we don't need you but we want to offer you an opportunity to join the, in, in with, with what God's doing here and what he's going to do in your heart through serving. Well, so it is with giving. 
It's not, I don't want something from you, I want something for you. Then our key text today says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits. Get this, honoring the Lord means I'm honoring him with my best, and that means I'm honoring him first, okay? As you read the Bible from cover to cover, you will quickly notice there is a principle taught throughout salvation history, first things first. Now, I want, I'm just going to give you some examples of how God repeats this over and over in different ways so that we get the message. And someone might say, well, I've heard you talk about this before, Clay. Yes, if you've been around here a while, you have. And if you stay around here a while, you're going to hear it again because this is an important theme in Scripture. First things first. It starts in the Garden of Eden. And God set up this opportunity to test the loyalty and the love of Adam and Eve while giving them free choice. He says, oh, I got a ton of fruit trees you can eat, you can drink, you can eat from all of them, but just avoid this one. It's the knowledge of, tree, of, of the tree of good and evil, and you don't want to know about evil. And we know how, what happened with the rebellion, but, but what God was doing there was he's saying, I want, you to, I want you to understand this principle of first things first. Put me first by, by um, obeying me on this. Later, when the nation of Israel was promised by God, that they would enter this land, the promised land. He says, you're going to conquer 10 cities. The first city, Jericho, you just walk around it and pray for seven days. I'll take care of the walls, okay? But he said, that first city, everything in it belongs to me. He said, don't take the plunder to your own home. It, 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 consider all the gold and silver and everything that's valuable in the city as devoted things and bring them to my house, God said. Here, you see, there's 10 cities. The first city goes to him. This is this principle of first things first. And one guy ignored God and hoarded some stuff, and he came under God's curse as a result. His name was Achan. Another way God taught this idea was through the special cons uh, consecration of the firstborn male. And we read about this in Exodus 13, 2, where it says, consecrate to me every firstborn male. This is God speaking. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animal. So a firstborn baby boy was consecrated to God, and because uh, in paganism, that means probably would the, it would be a sacrifice of that boy to God, but not in God's economy. Instead, he said, bring a spotless male lamb, a firstborn lamb, and redeem your son's life by sacrificing the lamb, which we know over and over throughout the Old Covenant is pointing forward to the ultimate lamb who died for us on the cross. But also, the firstborn from any part of the livestock was dedicated to God as he's teaching this principle, first things first. Not only the firstborn boys, not only the, the livestock was consecrated, but also the first of the crops, the first fruits of the crops. You see, they lived in an agricultural society, and a lot of people didn't get a paycheck like a lot of you do. They, they got produce, and so they would take the first and the best off the top, the first fruits, and offer that to God. Exodus 23, 19 says, bring the best, notice, not the leftovers, bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. Now, now notice all the words in that one sim simple little sen sentence here because it's, it's filled with principles that are still true today. The first word is bring, not give. There's nothing wrong with, with, with the word give. That's what we're doing when we give to, to, to God's work through his house. But God several times calls it bringing it, not just giving it. What's the difference? I give something that's mine. I bring something that's his. I'm just bringing a portion. He says, bring it, bring it. It's all mine. But I'm asking you as an act of worship to bring the first. Now notice the word best. Not something that was rotten and bruised and subpar. He says, bring the best. Don't, don't just collect, you know, all your rotten fruit in one basket and bring that. No, 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 this is about worship. And, and he says, bring the first fruits. Don't wait and see what's left over. Bring the first fruits. First things first. And where do we bring it? He tells us, to the house of the Lord your God. The first fruits were to be brought to the house of the Lord for his work. And in the old covenant, that was the tabernacle, and then it became the temple. In the new covenant, it's the local church. And, and this theme continues. You, you honor God, the Bible says, when you, when you put him first with your income, with your increase, bringing the best portion off the top 
to the house of God for his work. And that's, as I said, a principle taught throughout scripture. It starts at the very beginning of the story, right when the, after the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3, or Genesis 4, 3 and 4, it's Cain and Abel. In the course of time, notice, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. Made Cain very unhappy, and we know how that story ended. But notice, there's a couple issues here. One issue is I believe God had already laid down this principle of the, the lamb sacrifice pointing forward to Jesus. And that's what Abel does. He brings a firstborn from the flock. And, and, and Cain says, no, I'm going to do it my own way. And in the course of time, he brought some of the fruits. Doesn't say anything about first fruits. And here we see this principle, first things first. Another way God taught this principle was through the practice of tithing. This started long before the law of Moses, by the way. The first time we hear about it is Genesis 14, 20. And it's a story of Abraham when his nephew Lot and all of his house and all of his flocks and a whole bunch of, of uh, his family got kidnapped and taken into a foreign country by, a, by an evil king. And, and Abraham prays about it and decides to go get him. And he gets about 300 guys and says, hey, we're going to go, we're going to go get them. And they do. And they, will, they <laughs> wipe out. And they bring, they're bringing back all, all of the flocks and plus more that they took. And, and here comes this priest, kind of a mysterious priest named Melchizedek. And he's, there's so many shadows and types pointing forward to Jesus, and he's one of them because you can read about that in, in, in Hebrews and how Jesus is equated with Melchizedek. But Melchizedek um, encounters Abraham, and he's got all these spoils, and Abraham says, I'm going to honor God by giving you a tenth of everything. That's the tithe, 10%. Later in Genesis 38, 22, Jacob has this dream, a vision from God, and there's this ladder between heaven and earth with angels going up and down it, which we later find out in the early chapters of John's gospel is another picture of Jesus. He's the ladder between heaven and earth that connects us to God. And, and Jacob is so overwhelmed with this vision and God's promises about the fact that he's going to bless him with a, with a mighty nation of descendants that he says in Genesis 28, 22, um, all that I have and all that I get, I'm going to give you a tenth, a tithe, a tenth. It's worship. Then, of course, we come to the law of Moses, and the tithe was, was um, intended to be to support the ministry for the work of the temple, for the salaries of the priests and the Levites and the choir, the singers, those who worked full-time teaching God's word and ministering to his people. Many times, as you read the Old Testament, the people of God would rebel, they'd go into idolatry, and then uh, along would come someone who would le lead a revival back to God, and then they'd go into idolatry again. And one of those revivals after they had drifted was under King Hezekiah. And as a part of the revival, he says, we got to get back to basics, you guys. Second Chronicles 31, he says, he ordered the this is Hezekiah. We, he ordered the people living in Jerusalem to give the portion due the priests and Levites so they could devote themselves to the law of the Lord. The Israelites generously gave the first fruits of their grain, new wine, oil, and honey, and all that their fields produced. They brought a great amount, a tithe of everything. Notice first fruits and tithe are equated there in that Bible verse. Probably the most well-known verse that speaks to this topic is in Malachi chapter 3, where God says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. Notice that word test. Says the Lord God Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Now again, I want you to notice some key words in this verse, beginning with, once again, the word bring. God says, bring it. And, you know, it's a little bit different than giving, but it, it, it's what we do when we're, when we're giving. We're returning a portion of what God already owns. And then he says, bring the whole tithe. What does that mean? That means a full 10% off the top. Sometimes people ask me, and, and usually it's with a great deal of sincerity and wanting to do the right thing. They say, Pastor, should I, should, should I give tithe off the gross or the net? And, and I usually say, well, that's between you and God. But then I usually follow it up with, which one do you want to be blessed on, the gross or the net? 
because you can't outgive the Lord. That is one thing that is for sure. And, and so the tithe is, is, is a 10% of increase, of income, you know, um, probably a, at least once a quarter. Somebody in our congregation gets a, gets a blessing, sometimes unexpected, sometimes expected. They uh, get an inheritance or they sell something, and all of a sudden this large check comes in, which is, is a huge blessing to God's work when that happens, but it also shows those people are putting him first every time they get increase. And um, God blesses that, you know? It's not, it's not a legalistic thing. It's a thing of coming under his authority and under his blessing. And uh, my wife and I have seen this so many times over the years. When We built a house out in the country, and, fun, and when we sold it and moved to where we are now, we just sat down and figured out how much it cost us to build that, and then how much we sold it for, and wrote a, a large check to God's work through the local church on the difference. Because we know you can't give the Lord, and He always blesses those who put him first in this area. Like you shovel out, he shovels in, his shovel is bigger every time. So the whole tithe, and where do you bring it? The the text says to the storehouse. That's the place where people were fed and it still is. Where are you fed? It's in a different way now, but you're getting fed the word of God when you come here. You need to feed yourself all week as well if you want to grow and be healthy, but you need to have a dinner served up to you regularly. That is what happens here. And so we bring it to the storehouse. That's the place where we get fed, not to the United Way, not to the Salvation Army, not to all the other great charities. There's a place to support all of those, whatever's on your heart to support, do that. But, but do that as offerings over and above. The local church is where you're fed and is organized as an army to reach the world. And God says, bring it to the storehouse. And, and by the way, I would say, if you're visiting here and you belong to another church, don't tithe here, tithe there. Because that's what's important is that you bring it to where you're fed. And, and then the word test Now, this is the only place in the whole Bible where God says this. Look it up for yourself. This is the only category, this is the only place where God says, test me on this. And if you haven't done that, I challenge you to do it. And I've never heard someone who was sorry that did it with a sincere heart and desire to to honor God. And that's why many times, and I'm going to do it again today, we offer a, a tithe challenge. It's a money back, 90 day money back uh, guarantee. You can't beat this. You let us know, and and this is going to be confidential. Only a couple people are going to know about this. You let us know you want to start a 90 day tithe challenge. And at the end of 90 days, now you've got to be um, willing to prayerfully submit the other 90% to God in terms of managing, that's also his money he's trusting you with, managing it responsibly, right? But you put him first, take the test, and see what happens. Over and over and over again, people have found, and I just heard a beautiful story out on the plaza after first service where someone said, we did the math and we were gonna be in the red if we did tithe. But somehow, somehow, we learned to work through it and we are in a way better place now than we would have ever been if we hadn't have done that. So if you want to do that, do it. And, and if you say, I want my money back after three months, you'll get your money back and no questions asked. We're not going to publish your name. We're not going to show your picture on the screen. It's going to be confidential, okay? But I challenge you, if you haven't tried it, to just do what God says and test him. And then he says, you're going to get blessed. I'm going to open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing, there will not be enough room to store it. That's what happens when you're in proper alignment with the blesser. You become blessed so that you can be a blessing. You receive the tangible and intangible favor of God. You come under his covering, under his roof, under his authority and blessing. And it works. And, and you should know the opposite too. I, I shouldn't avoid reading the reverse of this principle. Because also in Malachi 3, we read this. God speaking, remember. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. Notice they're, they're different. Tithes, that's 10%. Offerings is over and above. You are under a curse, God says, your whole nation because you are robbing me. Whoa, that's strong language. Do you want to be cursed or blessed? I don't know about you, but I would rather have God's blessing on 90% than his curse on the 100%. That's just me. Now, I know what's, what somebody's thinking right now. Yeah, I can see, your, I can see your, your brain spinning right now. 
I know, I know, somebody's thinking this. Somebody is thinking, Clay, all of that tithing business was old covenant under the law of Moses. That's over because we're in the new covenant now. We're no longer under law now. Clay, you wrote a book called The Main Thing where you said that over and over and over. And then you, you did a series called Stay Free where you say we're no longer under the law. Let's stay free. So let's just put that whole tithe thing to bed, okay? We're, that's over. We've moved on. Somebody's thinking that. Well, I want to talk to you. Guess what? God intends for ministry support to happen in a similar way in the New Covenant that it happened in the Old Covenant. Similar principles. He said that, not me. Check this out. 1 Corinthians 9, 13 and 14. Apostle Paul writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? That's the Old Covenant he's talking about. In the same way, now he's talking about the New Covenant, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. He's, he's, he's telling us it's going to happen the same way. Now, when it comes to putting God first with our money, what changes in the new covenant? I submit two things change. First, the motivation is different. New covenant Christians are motivated by grace and not law. They are responding to God's love demonstrated, especially at the cross. And what did God do at the cross? Did he give us leftovers? <laughs> he gave his best, his firstborn, his best. In fact, Jesus is also called the first fruits because he's the first of many who are going to raise eternally from the dead. He's God's best. He's God's firstborn. He's God's first fruits. And the angels might have looked at that babe in a manger and certainly that bloody man on a cross and said, don't you think that's extreme, God? God did not send his leftovers. <laughs> He modeled first things first. And when I look at the cross, that becomes my motivation, not a law, to respond to Him and want to worship Him and honor Him with my best. So the motivation is different. And second, the bar is raised, not lowered in the new covenant. Some, sometimes I hear people say, I don't need to tithe because that's old covenant. You know, I'll just throw in a tip once in a while because I'm in the new covenant. Hey, if you're talking that way, be sure you understand what you're saying, okay? Be sure you've read the book of Acts. Because if you, in the book of Acts, under the revival of the Holy Spirit, as the new church is born, there were people who cashed out everything, who sold land, who sold houses to fuel God's ministry and, and didn't stop with the tithe. Now, not everybody was called to do that, but those who were did it. Some kept houses, some kept big houses, and they offered them up for the church. And the church grew in those houses early before they were able to build uh, buildings like we have years, many years later. So think about what you're saying when you say, uh, I, I, I'm a new covenant Christian, and I'm going to give like the new covenant Christians did. Because Jesus didn't lower the bar, he raised the bar on every morality issue. I mean, here's a couple examples. The, the, old, the old covenant said, don't commit adultery. Well, that's good. If you're married, you should not commit adultery. That's a good starting place. That's not a good ending place if you want a good marriage. Okay, that's the bare minimum. It, the, the new covenant says, don't even look with lust at someone you're not married to. And, and Jesus said that. And, and then the new covenant says, uh, don't just not cheat. Love your wife. Love your husband. Respect and love. And, and be willing to love like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, it says in Ephesians 5. Be sacrificial about your love. Take it to a whole other level than just don't cheat. The old covenant said, don't murder. Well, yeah, that's a good starting place. But Jesus said, hey, don't hate either. D don't get yourself in a place of unforgiveness. Um, in fact, love your enemies and do good things for them and pray for them. Now, that's a whole other level. You see, the new covenant is raising the bar, not lowering the bar on what it means to worship and honor the Lord and be faithful to Him. So 10% is a time-honored benchmark to be exceeded as we prosper, or we feel led to give to special needs inside or outside the church. Um, you may or may not know this, but there is a conference in Colorado Springs every year for people who have been so blessed with wealth 
and with surrender to God that they have chosen to live on 10% and give the rest away. Now, most of us couldn't do that if we wanted to and maintain you know, a, a decent lifestyle, but there are some people who could, who never would, and there are some people who are and are seeing tremendous blessings from God as a result. So see the tithe as a starting place, not an ending place. Maybe if you've never done this, it's a, it, it feels like that would be an ending place for you if you get started. But uh, see what God does and they'll come up, you know, many of you gave generously over and above your tithe in December to our Bring Hope Fund. And I'll be telling you more soon through our annual report um, how we ended, which was um, really good because of the generosity of these church, this church, and I'm looking forward to giving you some details on that. But, you know, Selena and I gave something extra to bring hope. We sponsored another child in December. Many of you did too. And that's not coming out of our tithe. That's offerings. That's something over and above. 10% is a minimum worship expectation, and I just encourage you to never use the old covenant as an excuse to be a, temper, a tipper, but, but to realize that 10% is, is, it's really more about faithfulness than generosity. For me, it is. I, I, I think of generosity starting above that, personally. And the Bible says in our key verse, honor the Lord with your wealth, with your first fruits. Now, if you've been doing this for years, then you know the blessings that come as a result of putting God first. You have seen, and you could give stories, many of you, of, of how you've seen God's tangible and intangible favor in your life as a result of putting Him first with your money. Jesus said, give and it will be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. In other words, you're going to get blessed in a bigger way than you are a blessing when you're willing to be a blessing. That's God's way of partnering with you. Now, it may be difficult for you because you haven't done this before, or maybe you're in a tough time and you got a lot of stuff going, you got debt. This is a plague for a lot of us in America. And Selena and I, we were younger, we made mistakes with credit cards and got into some consumer debt that took a while to get out of, and that's just bondage if you're in that. You know, we try not to, to um, you know, we cut up our credit cards finally. And the only way we got a credit card back was with a promise to each other we'd pay it off every month, which we have done since then. But if you're in a situation where you got a bunch of consumer debt hanging over your head, you might be saying, you know, I'm just under this load. Maybe someday I'll put God first with my money when I get out of debt. Well, that's between you and God, okay? But even while we were in debt, we chose, even when it didn't make sense, to keep putting God first and continue to see His blessing in helping us get out of debt by doing that. And I would encourage you to do the same. One time, a uh, single mom, many years ago, I was a younger pastor, a single mom comes to me and she says, you know, I really want to do what's right. I want to follow the Lord. And this, this area of giving, I'm having a trouble with that because I got three kids. My husband, previous husband, doesn't pay child support. I'm working and going to school because I want to do good for my kids and I'll do better after I get this degree. But right now, man... You add up all my expenses and all my projected income, and I'm already in the red without giving God anything. And I tell you, every fiber of my heart, because I felt for her, wanted to say, don't worry about it. Take a pass. God understands. Your situation is unique. But you know what? I can't find any place in the Bible that gives me permission to say that. As a faithful student of the Bible, I felt like all I could say is what God said. And I said, you know what? That does sound like a challenge. Why don't you test him? Because he said that, not me. Why don't you do, why don't you do a 90-day test? If you want, I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm telling you that God's the one that said test. So she said, okay, I'm going to try that. I don't know how it's going to work, but I'm going to try it. And then she comes back a couple months later and starts telling me stories. And she's so excited. She said, you wouldn't believe stuff that's been happening. She says, I got all of a sudden, and it doesn't always work like this for everybody. It's tangible and intangible, the favor. But, but, but she says, many times it is tangible. She says, first of all, I got this huge, unexpected refund check. I didn't know what was going on. It was just what I needed that week. And then my tires were bald, and I was so worried with winter coming about my car. And somebody from church shows up without me knowing they were coming. They parked their nice car out front and ask if they can borrow my car for a couple hours. I'm like, what is going on? And they come back, and there was brand new tires on my car. And she had this list of all of these blessings that she had seen because she had come under the roof, under the, the authority and the blessing of God in alignment with Him.
And it was beautiful. And I could tell you so many stories from my own life and from talking to others. But if you're a person that struggles, I want you to please believe this. God promises to take care of those who put him first. Jesus said, Matthew 6, 33, but seek first his kingdom. Here's that first things first principle. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. What things? Well, you read the context. It's talking about basic needs, food, clothing, the things we need, shelter. He says, hey, put God first, and he'll take care of your basic needs if you collaborate with him your basic necessities. You say, but I'm worried about tomorrow. Jesus, very next verse, he says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So here's my challenge to you. You do what you want with it. but, But I would just say, if you have not been putting God first with your money, if you have not been bringing it to the storehouse and supporting his work through the local church, why don't you consider turning over a new leaf and making a fresh start. Just have, if you're married, have a family council, talk about it, make a plan, write it down. There's power in writing it down. And by the way, um, this 90 day test is something that you could start at any time and you just call God on it and see what happens. I know it's going to happen. Keep in mind that it comes off the top when you're putting God to the test, and you're, the question is, will 90% with his blessing go farther than 100% without it? That's the test. And, and you, you can't say, God, if you help me live on 90%, I'll see what happens at the end of the month, I'll give you 10%. No, that's giving leftovers. That doesn't take faith. That's not putting God first. Too often people make this list of wants and needs, and then they see if there's anything left to support God's work to honor him. And, and they, this little, if they're making a budget, this 10% number gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And pretty soon, maybe it's 2% and they're still calling it tithe. Give whatever you want. That's between you and God. But don't call it tithe unless it's 10%, okay? Because that's what the word means. That's what tithe means. Uh, when, we're, when we're giving to God as an afterthought or somewhere down the list or at the bottom of the list, that becomes leftovers, not first fruits. And this is why a budget can be very helpful because then we, ha- we, we think about prayerfully managing the rest of God's money, which is our responsibility and writing things down can be helpful. God wants to bless his house. He loves his church. It's the center of his attention on earth. It's where he's doing his best redemptive work in the world. It's where life changing, it's where the gospel, the redemptive message is stewarded and proclaimed. And God wants his church to grow and thrive and prosper and be successful. So how does he do that? How does he bless his church? By blessing his people. That's how he's chosen to do it. God blesses his people. God could do it a different way if he wanted. He's God. He can do anything he wants. God could bless his church through direct deposit, like a lot of you do. He could go um, on our website once a month and just download a, a, you know, some, some resources. He could do that. He's God. But he doesn't choose to do that. Why? He, because of what it does for us that's positive that he wants to do in our hearts. He chooses to bless his church by blessing the members, and that way we get to cooperate with him, and our natural, materialistic, and self-centered hearts get changed over time in the process as we learn to be managers of his stuff rather than grasping and, and, and hoarding and owning. We become rivers, not reservoirs. We become conduits, not collectors. And we become helpers, not hoarders. So something happens in our heart. And listen, the way I manage money becomes a treasure test. Get this, the treasure test reveals where my heart is. Jesus said, Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Why didn't he say where your heart is, there your treasure will be also? Because that's true too. He didn't say that though. He said where your treasure is, there your heart. In other words, he says, your heart follows your treasure. You put your treasure where you want your heart to follow because it will follow. Now, every single time a pastor talks about money and giving, not just giving, but bringing it, somebody gets upset. 
So somebody's probably upset right now. And if you're upset, you're probably not the only one. Somebody else is probably upset too. But I would ask you, if you're upset or if you're uncomfortable, ask yourself, why is that? Don't say, well, because there are seekers here for the first time and they might be offended. No, seekers aren't offended by this message. They know that it must cost money to do what we do here. And if we're spending money because we, we want to reach them, then it must be, mean we care about them. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're mad because I just told you where your heart is and you didn't like hearing it. You see, putting God first with your money is truly a treasure test. And I will guarantee you this, nobody who's listening to me here or online, nobody who's got their heart in the right place and who has come under the, God's roof of, of authority and, and of blessing and who is, is bringing it and who has, who has decided that this is going to be a spiritual discipline in their life, nobody in that category is mad right now. In fact, they're sitting there, you're sitting there saying, amen, preach it, Clay. <laughs> I know. Listen, put your treasure in God's hands and your heart will follow. Invest your treasure only in this world and that's where your heart will be too. Invest in God's house if you want your heart to be there and get this, if you do, you can be sure that he will not only bless his house, he'll bless your house. And this is all about worship. Just think about this, my final point. My bank statement is a theological document. It tells who and what I worship. Just go down through your blank statement. I used to say your checkbook and your calendar, but nobody uses checkbooks anymore, uh, hardly. You go down through your bank statement and you see what's most important. Our key verse again is honor the Lord with your wealth and with your first fruits. And again, I want you to hear me say this because I mean it with all my heart. By teaching this, I, it's not, I, don't, I don't want something from you. I want something for you because I know the blessing that comes from proper alignment and surrender to the Lord. Every week we talk about three ways to give in case someone's new and doesn't know how to get on board. And um, many, many of you have gotten on board with online giving, which is a wonderful way to give. And uh, what a blessing it was that we started this way before the pandemic because many of you just continue to be faithful during the pandemic, put God first through your online giving. And that's a great way to do it is to sign up on the website and you can do a direct deposit or use a credit card. We get charged for credit cards, but whatever you want to do. Um, so then through that, you're, you're putting God first regularly and just at the same pattern that you get paid, whether it's weekly or, or biweekly or monthly. Some people, you know, it's, it's sporadic because they're a business owner or they're in sales or whatever. And maybe text to give is better for you because when you get blessed, then you can be a blessing. Just boom, hit it, it goes. And you can always give checks if you like in the back. We, we stopped passing the plate about five years ago. We took an experiment actually for six weeks to see what would happen and the giving went up. And we said, okay, I guess we're done passing the plate. I'd like to ask you to stand with me as we pray. Father, thank you for being interested in every area of our life. Even the areas that are more tender, sometimes more difficult. I personally want to surrender everything to you, every single area of my life, including my money, everything. I want to surrender to you. I struggle surrendering everything to you. And forgive me for the ways I have not done that. But I want to honor you. And as we sing this old hymn, let's do it as a prayer. I surrender all. You might even want to assume this posture with your hands open rather than this posture of your fists shut. This is just a way to say, God, I really do want to surrender everything to you and I want to come under your authority and your blessing. Let's sing this, let's sing this together. Let's sing it as a prayer.
Say 